welcome everyone to the greater community. Um, this episode of, of our series, it really focuses on a ministry called the Worship Wagon and, and the greater community as a show. It really exists to get a greater perspective about what God is doing locally and globally. And this week, I have been looking forward to this conversation for weeks with Joe and Bruce from the Worship Wagon. And so uh, could you guys introduce yourselves? How in the world does something like the Worship Wagon get started? Yeah, this is uh, Joe Ratterman, and uh, my wife and I have uh, been working with homeless for, uh, for going on, I think, uh, 16 years now. And uh, the Worship Wagon, we'll talk about that later, uh, you know, as we go, but it was kind of a, an, out, uh, an outgrowth of what we were doing, providing uh, food and other items uh, to the folks downtown Kansas City. Well, Bruce McGregor with Freedom Fire Ministries. We we started about 24 years ago, and our heart has always been to take basically church to the unchurched. We we've started in the federal housing developments just east of downtown, where about 85 percent of the residents there are unchurched, and so wide open mission field. And we've been providing church like services there since then. We do Friday night programming for youth and some different family ministry. And probably 10 years ago, the Lord kind of threw us a curveball because we'd started a little fellowship group that was meeting on, on um, Sunday mornings called Freedom Covenant. And, and a large uh, delegation of homeless started attending. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, very quickly, we had a ministry to the homeless. And it was something we did not anticipate, mm -hmm. but something we fell in love with and just in, totally enjoyed it. So I, God's hand in it enjoyed building meaningful relationships with some of our friends that were homeless. And it wasn't long after that, that I, I met Joe and things started turning. Yeah. Tell me about that you. first, that first conversation that you guys had as you were, this idea starts to come together. But I, I'll say this, we, we felt like we were supposed to plant a church uh, somewhere downtown and we'd been praying. We tried to explore a couple ideas and kept hitting walls and I was asked uh, by Mike Bickley, a mutual friend of ours, to, uh, to meet with Joe. And I, I really didn't know what it was about. But, uh, <laughs> but I went and met with Joe, and, uh, but it was Joe's idea. And so I'll let him tell the story from here. Okay. Well, I've, uh, you know, Bruce and I have definitely worked together from the very beginning on, uh, on this project. Uh, I think we both had d slightly differing ideas that came together when we met and we figured out how to make one, one idea come to life. But, um, you know, our, my, my motivation was to try and find a way to be, um, a little more intentional, uh, with our gospel delivery from our, from our group, which was called hope in the streets. And that was what I referenced that uh, my wife and I started with our family back in 2004. And we were, we spent years bringing food out to folks on the street. And, um, you know, we, we knew we were doing it, you know, because the Bible tells us, God tells us to take care of the poor. Um, but we found ourselves kind of moving, you know, from stop to stop and person to person just pretty quickly. And that uh, we weren't really able to have much of a, a faith impact um, or biblical impact. Uh, we were certainly meeting needs, but um, but we weren't able to spend the time that we thought we needed, and the format just wasn't right. You know, the format was take food around, uh, you know, 100 people around Kansas City each week, and uh, there just wasn't the time to to really minister or disciple people, and so we uh, we started a, a project uh, before the worship wagon that we called the Lazarus Program, and we put our heart and soul and you know some dollars into this to try and take a couple of the people that we knew because we built relationships with folks on the street and take them out of the homeless environment, you know, kind of quote, you know, fix them. Uh, that was our goal. I think that's a lot of folks, you know, the way they come into this in these ministries, they want to fix the problem. And we were no different. And we, we grabbed a couple of people that we thought had a high chances of success and wrapped our arms around them for a commitment of up to a year. We said, and, um, you know, one gentleman's name was Paul and we, he was probably our best candidate. And over the course of the year, we did manage to pull him off the street and put him into an apartment. Uh, we helped him kind of square away his tax situation to where he became, um, you know, kind of right with the IRS. We, uh, helped him 
find a job. He got, he held down a job. We brought him into our church. We involved him in a life group within our church. And, you know, with an idea that over the course of the year, we would kind of help him out a lot in the beginning. And then we would step away and, you know, have, have him graduate, if you will, and be on his own and no longer homeless. And, and I know it's a long story and you probably wonder why I'm talking about this, because why don't you just do more of that? Um, and the answer is, is it didn't work. Uh, after about a year, as we were pulling back our support, he started pulling back to his old homeless ways and eventually became what I consider to be a homeless person living in an apartment. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the things that got him onto the street were still there. You know, we, we really weren't able to change who he was. We changed his environment for a while, but we didn't really change who he was. And he really did uh, pull back. Uh, he pulled away from the church. He pulled away from the life group as we, you know, started pulling back our our direct involvement, and he became a homeless person living in an apartment. And so that that made me, you know, think, you know, why we put a lot of effort into this. We really had the right heart, and we wanted to, you know, take that as a model and repeat it over and over and over again. Yeah. And it was through that experience, you know, God was teaching us that, you know, sometimes people, you know, aren't meant to be changed. They're just meant to be loved and loved where they're at. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you know, the idea came to us, came to me and my wife, like, maybe we need to figure out how to bring, you know, church and the gospel message into the environment where the people are at, as opposed to taking them out of the environment and putting them into a world that we thought was familiar. And so that was where I was coming from was how do we, how do we bring church into the street? Um, because this model that we thought was going to work of taking people out of the street clearly was not going to work, um, at least in our experience. And so that's where, that's where our pastor put us in touch with Bruce and Bruce and I started talking about this. And I think it took us Bruce, uh, several months, maybe a year before we really kind of took the first step. No, that's right. Yeah. When I, uh, when I met with Joe, um, we still hadn't totally given up on an idea of, of a different type of church plant. And so as a team, we started praying about it. And over time, it just, you know, you, you just know that you know that God's leading you to do something. And that's what we knew about Worship Wagon, that that was the church plant that God was calling us to, it's to partner with Joe. And I'll say this too, you know, one thing I have found in ministry is partnerships are, are really meaningful and wonderful when done right. And as Joe said, this has been a partnership from the beginning. And I've, I've so enjoyed doing it with Joe. I know I've been enriched personally because of it. Likewise. Also, and also the partnership with the different churches that help out, like Community Covenant. So the partnerships have, have made it more enjoyable. I think we've been more productive and had a greater impact because of it. So I'm, I'm very grateful yeah. for that. And, I, and I'll emphasize that partner part uh, that Bruce is talking about, you know, one of the things that kept me from thinking on my own before I met Bruce from starting a church was the idea that, you know, oh my gosh, this goes from just, you know, a family putting in their time to now we need to have, you know, a corporate structure. We have to have salary and benefits and hire pastors and, you know, like this, the, the structure of this just got really big in my mind. I didn't know how to manage it. And, you know, I'm not a pastor. I'm a business executive retired. Uh, luckily, you know, Bruce has been the, the, the lead on, on, you know, kind of ministering to our church and how it gets formed and how it gets rolled out. Um, but the idea that, you know, that we were able to bring in churches like Community Covenant um, to own a part of the monthly delivery of our gospel message and worship service meant that we didn't have to hire folks. We didn't have to have a staff. We didn't have to have a pastor and a backup pastor and all that infrastructure we're able to tap into the community around us to bring together kind of a, you know, a, a, a new church out of all those resources. So that was, that was absolutely key that this can be done if we tap into the, the great people that are around Kansas city and the different churches that uh, come in to, to take part ownership in what we're doing. Yeah. I want to back up a second because you both had kind of mentioned something that it kind of got me curious you both kind of talked about this journey of, you know, serving the homeless. How did that initial, I mean, this it might be taking you back a ways, but how did that initial desire come about in your heart to say, you know, I really feel like God wants me to minister and serve the homeless population. Like, where does that 
where, where's the start of that story for, for each of you? Joe, I'll let you start on that one. Yeah, so um, uh, my journey started, uh, I believe, with, uh, with a time in prayer in church uh, where the idea to go out and help the homeless literally came out of what appeared to be nowhere. Like it wasn't on my mind. It wasn't on my heart. There was no program at our church. Uh, I was simply praying quietly in church before uh, the service started back in 2004. It was the winter. And it, this idea, like, you got to go out and do something for the homeless hit me like, like God was speaking like you and I are right now. I mean, it wasn't quite that clear, but it was pretty darn clear. And it was just a strange, solid idea that came out of apparently nowhere. But, you know, it was in prayer and I know God was nudging me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I don't know why he, you know, intervened in my prayer and pushed me hard in that direction. But, um, you know, I talked about it with my family immediately after church that day. And said, hey, I got this idea that we need to do something. And uh, so we took our kids that were teenagers at the time uh, and after church drove to Walmart mm. and naively got four shopping carts and went through the store and started thinking, what does a homeless person need? Uh, you know, times eight. And so we were going to put together eight homeless, uh, you know, survival kits. Mm. And uh, we bought a bunch of stuff that in retrospect, you know, was probably not the greatest stuff to buy. Uh, but, you know, our heart was in it and we felt like we were, you know, doing the right thing for the right reason. So we put together these eight survival kits uh, as a family, took them home, assembled them all up. And then, you know, that was kind of the first, the first, uh, you know, kind of fork in the road. We're sitting there with these packs on our living room floor and they're like, okay, now what? <laughs> I guess we know what homeless people look like. I mean, we lived in the suburbs, didn't really have much exposure to homeless folks and didn't quite know how do we take these packs and do something with them. And so through a little bit of research, we found the Salvation Army in Kansas City had a program that would take food out to the homeless. And we contact, you know, they, they were receptive when we called them up and said, yeah, we'll, we'll take those bags from you and we'll give them to the people who really need them. So we knew that our efforts were going to be, you know, resulting, you know, in a good, good delivery, but we didn't feel, you know, like we were experiencing, you know, the, the gifting part or the, or the delivery. And so they invited us to come out and uh, deliver food and see the kind of folks that we might be helping. And so that's where, uh, you know, just kind of slowly got pulled into, if you will, the homeless support network in Kansas City for me. It was interesting. I was pastoring a church out south. It, it, it started as a little church plant and grew exponentially. Not because of me. I was the peewee pastor. I was the one that got coffee for all the other guys. But <laughs> I learned a lot from that. And, and there was a season when um, I just knew my time was up there. And, and I always felt in my heart a call to work in the city. Mm. I'd grown up uh, with a ministry that our church in Wichita was involved with that had influenced me a lot. It was an urban ministry. So I always felt deep down that would be my, my role. And I remember about the time where I transitioned out of that church, uh, some folks were praying for me. And one older gentleman was praying. And, and I, I just think, you know, in retrospect, it was one of those God things where the spirit was speaking to him. But he said, I think the Lord has called you to minister to the homeless. Mm. And it really resonated with me. And it wasn't long after that that we started Freedom Fire. And my, my expertise has always been working with kids, to be honest, and um, working with junior hires, which in retrospect really prepared me to work with homeless, I think, <laughs> uh, with, with the commotion and all the activity and stuff. But uh, so that's what we started with, with the ministry was working with kids. And, and I wouldn't change that at all. And it's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And I always kind of took that word, you're going to be working with the homeless, was that I was working with kids that um, maybe are in a house, but not in a home, so to speak, you know? It's kind of like what Joe was saying, Paul was a homeless guy living in an apartment. Yeah. And, and, but, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, as I had mentioned earlier, I, I, I feel like there was a divine ambush <laughs> where God just ambushed us and brought a, a, uh, an addition to our ministry, which is caring for the homeless. And that happened when we, we started a little church plant out of, out of uh, Hope Faith downtown, which Joe and Sandy have worked with in the past. And that's when we started getting a large delegation of homeless people and our hearts were just given to them. And we, we just felt the pleasure of God doing it. 
I don't know if you, if you ever watched the movie Chariots of Fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric Liddell is the star of that movie, a true story about an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. And one of his famous statements is that when he run would run, he would feel the pleasure of God. Yeah. Mm. Well, when we care for the poor, like on Monday nights, when we're down there setting up and I'm circulating around, meeting with you know, our, our parishioners, if you will, I just feel the pleasure of God. I just know that's where we're supposed to be. And, and I also believe this. I, I believe that you know, the Bible, there's about 2,000 verses in the Bible, which is pretty substantial, uh, talking about God's heart for the poor. Yeah. And, and there's... There's many of us who've grown up in suburbs, have known the Lord for a long time, that are missing out on a huge part of God's heart yeah. because we've never touched the lives of the poor. And, and when we do that, you know, there's something that resonates in our hearts because it's in God's heart. Yeah. And so, so that's part of what I've felt through Worship Wagon. It's just God's pleasure. I've felt his heart in it. We, we've seen some incredible things happen. Uh, we, we don't always see people's circumstances, living circumstances change. But I know in many cases, we know their eternal trajectory has changed because they've come to know the Jesus. And yeah. you know, I believe in Romans 1, 16, you know, I'm not ashamed of the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it's the power of God. So, yeah. um, so we fully believe in that. The gospel transforms people. And I know some of them, they may never get off the streets or live a normal Western lifestyle existence. But I do believe in Revelations 21, too, that there'll be a day yeah. when all things will be made right. Yeah. And so, so anyway, Amen. that's, that's kind of how we got started. Yeah. So then I would imagine, you know, as, as Joe, you're talking about, you know, taking your family after church to go to Walmart and, and make up some bags. And Bruce, as you're talking about, you know, kind of a word spoken over you that you should go do work in the city. I would imagine over those years, your perspectives sort of change and grow and you learn more. Like, how do you see your perspective of even the homeless population? How has it changed or how have you, what have you learned in all of those years you spent with the poor? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier, Tom. Um, for me, the aha moment was that we're called to serve and love people where they're at. And that, you know, like most people that kind of come into a homeless ministry, uh, you know, volunteering at first, see this is a big area where we need to go fix it. You, know, you see governments like, oh, we need to fix our homeless population, we need to make it go away. Um, and there, you know, there, there is room. I, I know there's room, you know, for some individuals to change their, their life circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a vast majority of, uh, homeless folks, at least, you know, as Bruce and I call the chronic homeless or the, the nomad homeless, uh, that they're not going to change their life circumstances. Um, maybe they can't, maybe they don't want to, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, uh, love them and administer and and minister and disciple uh, to them right where they're at and you know that's that's where I think the worship wagon in our church services every Monday night really resonate now and you know I wouldn't have seen it that clearly you know when we started 15 years ago 16 years ago um, you know the the idea that that we're going to provide a, a constant weekly opportunity for biblical uh, learning, biblical training, for worship, for fellowship, for people who clearly are not going to get that unless we bring it, you know, into their environment. Same way that a lot of suburbanites aren't going to go to church if they have to drive more than 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, if there's a church around the corner, then we'll go. It's convenient. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we, we need, we, we're providing a way for, for God to reach uh, through, through worship and through message and through prayer uh, people that probably wouldn't otherwise, you know, have that opportunity. And so that, that for me has been the big kind of principle learning that, uh, that you can, you can and need to serve and love people where they're at instead of always looking at situations as something that need to be fixed. Yeah. Uh, I think also, uh, tagging on to that, how you measure success mm. is important. If your measurement of success is that they all end up in a home the job looking just like a, a suburbanite, then you're, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it's just not going to happen. Yeah. But, if, but if it's helping them 
get connected with our, our loving father. They experience God in a deeper way. Their faith grows. Um, uh, then that's a success. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that happen mm -hmm. frequently and in, in very meaningful ways. You know, as you know, Tom, because you're down there all the time, some of those folks, it's the highlight of their week. They can't wait yeah. to be there. And I, I, I pray for this all the time, but I, I really say, I really feel like sometimes there's just a bubble of grace <laughs> over that little area. And when people come in, they just experience the peace of God. Yeah. And, you know, the cares of the world just kind of evaporate for that moment. And if we can do that for them, connect them with, with God, their, their Heavenly Father, man, I feel like that's a huge success. And we have had some people return to more normalized life. In fact, just a few blocks from where I'm at right now, a guy named Gary, who Joe knows, he was one of our first guys that's, that was homeless, now has a house and has been living there for the last couple of years. And so you do see that. Uh, we have another gal named Nicole who has a job and an apartment now. So we do see that, but most aren't going to go that route. Hmm. And so our, our goal is to connect them with their Heavenly Father yeah. and, and help them have a meaningful relationship. And it, it has made a difference yeah. in many people's lives. And I'll mention another success story, Bruce uh, and, and Tom, you guys have both seen this. You know, the when you have one of our homeless parishioners, you know, lead an effort to grab everybody around in a circle and pray mm -hmm. and have that person lead the group in prayer. Uh, even, you know, even if, if that person, you know, happens to maybe have had a few drinks before he showed up not totally intelligible to us necessarily, but, uh, but you know that their heart has been touched when they want to grab people that they don't know around in a circle and get down on a knee and pray and lead a group in prayer. To me that, you know, you know, Bruce and, or Tom, you know, or I, you know, any of us could do that, but to have one of our homeless folks uh, be the person who not only looks forward, to, you know, not only does it, but looks forward to it. That to me is, you know, a clear sign of, uh, of success for what we're trying to do. Yeah. So you guys have a meeting and you start talking about details. How does it go from a conversation to you're actually meeting? Like, how do you choose the location? Who, how do you decide what the format, the delivery system? And I've been around for several years, but I don't know that I was a part of that very first, like couple times when you were sort of just starting to figure out. So how do yeah, how did you kind of, get this ball rolling well, we first decided on picking the right time of the year when it was really <laughs> and really warm <laughs> i'll let joe tell that part of the story yeah so um i can't remember how many months we were planning and and talking and meeting and you know getting ready to do something but at one point we decided that november 17th of 2017 um was going to be the was going to be the day was that right no not not 2017 Gotta be earlier than that because I've yeah. been at least we've been at it for six years, so <laughs> fifteen. Fifteen. So I know it was November seventeenth, uh, and we had had an especially mild fall leading up to this date, and so that seemed like a very safe date. The week before Thanksgiving, a week or two before Thanksgiving, typically you've got good weather, yeah. and um, and so we started putting all of our our um, effort around making something happen that night. I know Bruce took the lead on bringing, uh, bringing our worship uh, a leader. Um, and uh, and I, I worked with the Vittle Van, which is our food delivery for Hope in the Streets to coordinate a time to be there. And I think Bruce was gonna, you know, were you gonna lead the, deliver the message that night, Bruce? I can't remember if it was you giving the message. Yeah, I think, I think it was me. Yeah, and so we had everything all lined up and sure enough, that uh, that weekend leading up to it, the forecast started coming out, and it was not going to be pleasant. We picked the coldest day of the year. Uh, it was 17 degrees on the 17th of November. I remember those two numbers together. And the third 17 was uh, at 17th and Beardsley, which is up on a hill, completely exposed to the north wind that was coming in and just freezing us to the bone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and our, our worship leader was, his fingers were just, he couldn't feel them. He was trying to play the guitar, so we had to look. We had done not a very good job of bringing warmth to the environment. It was outside in a parking lot, and we had a little propane heater with a couple of, uh, you know, glowing heads. Well, one of them wasn't glowing, so <laughs> it was, it, we had to keep relighting it. We were, 
froze to the bone. And uh, I think I think half of our potential you know participants that night wandered off before we really got fully going. Uh, timing wasn't all perfect, but uh, you know I think I think that was a really excellent experience because I can't imagine a worse night to try and start on. Uh, and that told me because one of my concerns was if you're going to do this in Kansas city, we've got a lot of crazy weather that we're going to have to deal with. And uh, is it even possible to do this week after week after week in Kansas city with the crazy weather that we got? And so we were, God gave us a good lesson that yes, you can figure it out and you need to go back and work harder on bringing warmth to the environment, which we did. That was a great learning experience. And so we've figured out how to bring more heat, more heaters to the situation is actually a draw you know, so now in the wintertime, that lesson yielded basically an extra reason why people want to come. So they can come for the worship, they can come for the message, they can come for food, and they can come for warmth. Yeah. And so not it's not a deterrent now, it's actually an attraction in the wintertime. So, uh, so yeah, I, I recall that God set us up for the worst possible night in our minds on, on delivering uh, a first service. But uh, we learned a lot. He was faithful. Um uh, uh, it was it was a good night. I just know that after that night, I spent a little time on Amazon, bought long underwear and wool socks. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that lesson right away. So how did you make your way from that spot to First and Grand where it's been for for all the time that I've come down? It's been a, for the First and Grand locations. How did you get to that? Make, how did you make that decision for that strategic spot? It was a middle band stop, wasn't it, originally? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we we tried to figure out how to, you know, leverage our resources and the Vittle van that, uh, that my wife and I have been working on had several stops around Kansas City. And what we realized was that uh, finding a place where people were already going to be yeah. was vital. And if we could find a place that has some kind of cover, because uh, that parking lot experience definitely woke us up to being exposed to the elements. Uh, and, you know, God has definitely blessed us with that location. Um, you know, it's not, it, there's, there's really only a roof over our head. It's the underside of that bridge. There aren't walls. Um, the wind could move through there. The rain could come in there, but it doesn't. It's a big enough bridge that when we get underneath of it, uh, we have never once been wet. Uh, we've, we've had rain on the outside, you know, just a few feet away. We've had snow on the outside, but never where we're standing. Uh, we've always had a path to just enough space to do what we set out to do that's, you know, got at least some cover. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll say in six years of doing this, uh, we've only missed a couple of Mondays. Um, and, you know, I know at least one of those was because the road was completely iced and we couldn't drive there. But otherwise, we've been blessed with pretty tolerable, you know, weather for six years running. And I, you know, I just, I just see that as a, you know, as a confirmation that God wants us to be there and he's providing. Yeah. Bruce, can you talk about what makes that location a gathering spot for the homeless? Like what, what is, what makes that, a, I mean, I know it's like a Vittle van stop, but why is it a Vittle van stop? Why is there a lot of people yeah. in the area? Well, it's right next to the woods that run, runs along the Missouri river. And there's, I know it ebbs and flows the numbers, but roughly a hundred people that live in the woods down by the river year round. Mm. And so it's just a natural gathering place. The river market area seems to be a, a place for the homeless. And now with the, the trolley, I think that's what we call it, runs through there all the way to the uh, plaza yeah. or at least the Crown Center. Um, that's also a major thoroughfare for uh, the homeless, the mode of transportation. Gotcha. And so it, it drops them off right there near First and Grand. I think they get off at Third Street. So it's easy for them. Also, you know, we have a second location at 20th and Oak. And, um, and it's the same thing. Uh, there's some woods down by the railroad tracks where a lot of homeless live. And so it's just a natural spot where the homeless gather. So it, it makes it easy. So people probably don't, that are listening or watching this, probably don't realize that there are these kind of settlements of homeless different parts of the city can you guys talk a little bit about what is what are those you know camps like what's mm. life like in a, in a homeless camp in Kansas City well there's a lot of variation um, there are some where, where some of our friends that 
are living down by the river and stuff, they will, they'll try to find a very secluded spot because they don't want people to know where they're at because a lot of crazy stuff happens. And so they try and try and find a place where they can secretly put up their tent. But then there's others that create a whole village. We've seen some where there's a whole network of tents that are, are set up down there. And then some just don't even care about tent. They'll just get a, a couple sleeping bags and, and go underneath a bridge, a viaduct, and, and sleep there. You know, when the weather's good, we'll, we'll see them down just sleeping underneath a tree along the road. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a variety of types of camps that you'll find. And I noticed like what, so <laughs> you're talking about weather. My first night was, I think it was April. It must have been 2015. I think, I want to say you guys started November of I think 2014, I think actually is when we I started. November 14. And I think I came April of 15 was my first month, March or April. And there were tornado sirens going off. Um, <laughs> and it was a downpour. And I remember, you know, you, you, you mentioned, Joe, like I didn't get wet. I got wet getting out of my car, walking to the spot where I was going to preach. But once we got under the bridge, we were fine. I remember that I brought a, I was doing youth ministry at the time and I brought a couple students down with me to help lead worship. And their parents actually came down and picked them up because they were, they were like, Oh, there's a tornado <laughs> warning. I don't feel great about having my kids out. And I was like, okay, I understand. That makes sense. I, I get that as a, as also <laughs> as a parent that you might not want your teenagers downtown and also during a, a tornado warning I, I, outside. I, I understand. But I notice when I come down, you know, one of the things, well, a couple of things I've noticed, you know, it's, it's very self-contained, you know, you've, you guys have figured out a way to, you know, get everything you need into a trailer that is easily accessible. It's easy. You've got a little crew that comes together. Um, I've also noticed that, you know, your music is really important. So you've got, even before we're set up to do worship, you've got music playing. And so, Talk about some of the strategy behind, I mean, you have location being in close proximity with a population, but also you kind of set yourselves up to draw attention to yourselves a little bit, right? Well, yeah, yes and no. Um, we, we definitely believe that the music part of our services are oftentimes the most impactful. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the constant, regular biblical teaching is vital and important. Right. Um, but uh, wh where we see physically the impact right away, much of the time is when we're when we're you know doing the worship part, the music part. Yeah. Uh, that re you know I've I've seen that take hardened uh, you know veterans of the street uh, who you would have thought were just as tough as nails and be crying privately in their chair uh, as they're listening to Amazing Grace being played on a guitar by a by a thirteen year old. Yeah. Um, it's the music is is vital uh it's something that can we can connect with right away and maybe provides a channel you know into the biblical teaching uh you know uh, as well um but you know i would say that we're we're trying to uh make sure that we don't make a huge presence in in the area that we're at and that we can you know continue to do what we're doing by by being uh, conscientious of our neighbors Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, keeping a little bit of a low profile in terms of, you know, where we're physically at. And so this bridge is down, you know, near first and grand away from many homes, away from many businesses. And so I think, you know, if we were to try and set up shop right in the middle of Kansas city on, you know, in the front of, uh, of, uh, you know, bus businesses, or in a public park that was frequented a lot that, you know, that could potentially take us out of business. And so we, we've got a place that's easy to get to. It's near a lot of homeless folks. It's covered and it's secluded all at the same time. It's kind of like just almost a miracle of where it's at and what it is for us. It's a stark contrast too, for me, especially, I haven't been to the, the, the other location, but when you drive down, and I, people that I bring down with me are often struck by how close it is from homeless camp to pretty nice apartments and pretty nice shops and yep. people just going about their business with having no clue that a couple hundred yards away there is this going on. How often do you have folks that just might ride their bike or be on the walking path that, that kind of walk up and say, you know, what's going on? How often do you see that happening? 
it's fairly frequent that we will get someone living in the lofts down there to stop and participate. We had a mom and her daughter has started coming several times. They're kind of hit and miss, but they live in the lofts close by. And they said, man, we're going to make this our church. Wow. And they, they just start coming. Um, we also have a young lady named Brittany who comes uh, regularly, lives in the lofts down there. And, uh, and she'll come every Monday night. She can. She actually works in a hospital, in an operating room. Oh, wow. and she'll come in her scrubs sometimes. And so she may be there tonight in her scrubs. But so we, we do see that happen. And it, it's, it's really uh, fun to, to have that part of the community come and be touched by the Lord, too. Um, you know, our, our primary target is obviously our, our homeless right. friends that live in the woods. But we do have a number of suburbanites that come obviously from Community Covenant on the first Monday of each month, but some others that come every Monday. And it's, it's, it's kind of been a byproduct of what we're doing, where we see some homeless folks uh, really, I mean, not homeless folks, but suburban folks really have their hearts touched. I think it's powerful. Um, yeah. I will say this little note. I thought of this when Joe was sharing about his journey. Um, uh, hopefully you won't mind me saying this, Joe, but... Uh, but Joe has done very well in business and has been a, a, a if you will, a, a business celebrity of, of sorts and has done great. And I think part of why, at least in my estimation, that Joe has navigated uh, business life and what I call even the perils of prosperity, uh, because there's some real pitfalls with the fast lane. And I think part of the reason why Joe and Sandy have done so well at navigating that is because they have purposely engaged in caring for those who, who need help. And, I, uh, and that's been a blessing for others, but I think it's done something for their hearts and their spiritual equilibrium that's really powerful. And so I, I feel like that's what's happening for some of our suburbanites that come down. Yeah. It just keeps their spiritual equilib equilibrium, keeps life in perspective yeah. for them. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a powerful thing. Yeah, well, I want to add on to what Bruce just said too. I think the the people that are coming uh, in that are not homeless uh, become part of the community that we've created, this new church, and that diversity is important. You know, I think this this whole project would not work if it were, you know, if the idea were we're going to have folks from the suburbanite area come and preach to the homeless people and then go home. Uh, I think the fact that we've got a mix of people from the local community, from the suburban community, from the homeless community, all intermixing together every Monday in a diverse church environment uh, is good for everybody that's there, and you know, including the homeless. I think I think you know, homeless individual who thought, "Hey, I'm just uh, I'm just here to be preached to," uh, me and the other ten guys next to me, and then all these people just disappear. Uh, that sense of community wouldn't be there, and so there's a sense of normalcy. Uh, for the homeless that we're serving when they can sit side by side with someone from, uh, you know, Johnson County uh, or Liberty or wherever and have, you know, maybe one of the few normal conversations that they're going to have that week uh, and a little bit of fellowship with somebody who isn't exactly like them, who isn't homeless. Um, and so that, that mix, I think, has been vital to our success as well. Yeah, how, how have you seen that community kind of grow, develop and grow? Because I feel like I've seen it as well. It's become a very fully formed church community of a community of faith. You know, from that first parking lot experience in November of 2014, where you're wind whipped and people are kind of like ducking out to, you know, a situation where you got people that hang out long after the program is done or the service is done. How have you seen it develop? What do you think has been that? you know, draw that has really, I mean, there are some weeks where I'm like, man, there is a lot of folks down here, you know? So what is it about, or and yeah, how have you seen it? How have you seen it develop over the years? I, well, what, one thing I've, I've seen is a, a real attraction for authenticity. Yeah. And just being real. I feel like, you know, and, and I'm, I'm t picking on myself here. I grew up in a suburban church. I pastored a suburban church for years. And it just seems so often in suburbia and in and, and mainstream Christianity, our relationships are built on strengths yeah. and our successes. And we tend to, to wear masks sometimes and we're not so vulnerable. And, but down, down under the bridge, it's just raw and it's real. And I think people just feel like they can just be themselves and be authentic. And, 
we had one uh, we had one worship leader who I, I thoroughly enjoy that, that came down from Journey uh, Bible Church, and he was leading worship, and it was, I think it was his first time that he did it with his family, and he said, and this is a guy who's traveled, done a lot of worship for years and years, and he said, this is my favorite place to lead worship. He said, where else will, where, will you have a person on the front row with their hands up in the air worshiping God, and in one hand is a cigarette, and the other hand is a can of Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah. But they're worshiping with all their heart, you know? It's just raw and it's real. And like Joe said, sometimes you'll see some of these hardened guys with tears just rolling down their face. And so I think it's the authenticity of it. No, I, I've said a, a lot that it's probably my favorite place to preach. I mean, I've got a chance to speak a lot of different contexts as well. And, you know, just preached yesterday on Sunday morning at here at Community. But I call it a church palate cleanser. You know, there's something about, you know, again, I'll, I'm a suburban church pastor where, you know, you kind of get a very polished experience sometimes on a Sunday morning or in a community where you're not really wanting to show, you know, what's really going on or you want to just, you know, the, if you ask somebody how you're doing, they're going to say, I'm doing fine. Um, there's just something that you strip all of that polish away and it's all you've got left is the gospel. All there is left is Jesus. And there's something really beautiful about that, that you experience. I know Jason's the same way, you know, to come down and lead worship. I think, you know, for both of us, we got a lot going on and, and Monday sometimes can be really full days, but I wouldn't miss it, man. Like I would miss mm -hmm. coming down. And I think the only times I've missed is when I've had a commitment where I've had to be that I couldn't get away from, or I think I had my sabbatical, you know, or I intentionally stepped back, but man, I, it's a highlight, you know, there that you're right. There's an authenticity about being in that environment with those people. Um, and not just when I say those people, I don't just mean like, I think it's the mixture that Joe, you're talking about of suburbanites and folks that live up in the river market, they're walked down and people who live in the, you know, on the streets, like just that there's a mosaic that has been created that it, it is its own thing at this point. Um, <laughs> couple of things to add there. Um, you know, our, we don't have a, an altar or a stage. We're on the same level as those that are, are participating, our parishioners. In fact, our our altar is a Corona rug. <laughs> yeah, very ironic this year, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. Um, and we've, we've worked really hard. Bruce and I have had it as a philosophy of, of Worship Wagon that, uh, that as we bring in partners, uh, that they come in to provide that regular kind of normal worship experience and biblical teaching as opposed to thinking that, Hey, here's this mission field where we're going to come in, make a quick hit and then bust out of here. Uh, it's about relationship and we want to see the same folks coming, you know, month after month and, and building those first name basis relationships. And so that's where I think that you really reinforce the community is when we're all on the same footing. Uh, there isn't those that are up, preaching and those that are listening, we're all together in the same small area. It's small enough that we can all know each other. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a really vibrant, small church environment uh, where we're all coming from the same place and on the same level. Yeah, sure. I would, I'll just tag on to the, that. You know, we had talked about this before, but um, at, at Worship Wagon in particular, and this isn't necessarily true for some of our other uh, ministries that we do at Freedom Fire, but when we have people come in, it's not so much to volunteer, like they're doing something, although obviously you and Jason are, are doing that, uh, but it's to participate. Yeah. It's, it's to be part of a family and to worship alongside your friends from the city. I, I oftentimes will challenge new folks coming in that they want to do something tangible. And so the tangible thing I challenge them with is to learn the names of at least three people yeah. and one interesting fact about them. And if you do that, it'll be a meaningful time because you're starting to build a relationship. And that, that's really what it's about is, is providing meaningful relationships with each other. And then most importantly, with the Lord. Yeah, I feel like there is a whole different experience of the worship wagon once you break into the fear that sometimes one brings with them downtown to the worship wagon. I know that, you know, that's been sort of the barrier sometimes where our folks have had to push through of, I'm like, come down. Like, well, what's it going to be like? What am I going to have to do? Who am I going to have to talk to? How is that going to go? Are they going to want to hear from me? And I usually just say, 
find somebody that's been going for months or years and just be their shadow. And it, yeah, when you have that moment where you just have two people kind of sitting on a curb, like you say, Joe, eye to eyeball, there's not like, you know, you don't want to be standing over top somebody. You don't want to be towering over somebody. You want to be sitting on the level. And that happens all the time down there. Um, yeah, that is, I think that is a, it's just a different, I think it, it gives us different eyes to see those who, the poor. I think it, you know, so often we talk about the poor as an issue. Like you were saying, Joe, like, let's fix poverty. Let's do this. Let's write a bill. Let's start an initiative. Let's do a resource drive to end poverty. Instead of saying well, that there's John over there. What's John's story? There's Gary over there. What's, what's Gary's story? And, and a lot of times it's a lot more complex. I think sometimes, you know, when people are coming down from the suburbs, they have an idea about, well, this is, this is why they're homeless. Right. And once you sit down and say, How, you know, tell me your story, if they're willing to tell their story, a lot of times it's, there's a lot of like, oh man, this is, this could, I could be this person with a few different, my life took a couple different turns. I could totally be this person. Yeah. There's also a dimension too that I think is really cool is when you start building these meaningful relationships, uh, uh, this is true with some, not all of our, our uh, friends that are, are homeless, um, but you'll, you start learning from their faith. Yeah. There's one particular guy down there that's just as joyful as can be, but he lives on a park bench in front of Union Station. Yeah. I'm thinking if this guy can have the joy of the Lord in that <laughs> circumstances, I, you know, I, it's convicting. I, you know, also another thing I've seen that's really common, and we've seen this at Freedom Fire even with our youth, but I've seen it under the bridge as well, is the level of generosity yeah. where people will give almost maybe everything they've got. It's like the widow's might. Yeah. And, and just to see that generosity and kindness at times, again, is, is convicting and, so I've, I've learned a lot just spiritually, you know, and been challenged in my faith because of what some of my friends who are homeless have, have learned through the years. And so I've, I've been enriched by them. So it really, you, you know, you got a good relationship going when it becomes a two-way street, yeah. you know, and, and both people are being enriched by it. Yeah. And that, that's when something's really clicking right. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, Years ago, I took a group of, of uh, high schoolers down to the plaza and gave them all, you know, 20 bucks or something and said, hey, okay, all right, you got an hour to bless somebody. And they all had different ideas about what they wanted to do. And it, we, we, we kind of dropped in at that corner where there's the Winsteads right at the edge of the plaza. And there's often people kind of with their signs right on the street there. And so they're like, what do we do? And I'm like, just go talk to them and ask them if they'd like you to buy them dinner. And it, they were shocked because the first person they talked to said, you know, I've actually just eaten, but the guy down the street right there, he hasn't eaten yet. So go talk to him first. <laughs> and, and my, the youth group kids were like, are you kidding me? Like you, yeah, you just ate a meal, but you don't know if you're going to eat another meal. Like why wouldn't they want to just hoard as many resources as possible? But in my experience, that's not, I haven't seen that as much on the street. I've seen more of the, well, I'm good right now, or I've got a little extra. So my little extra, I'm going to give to this person sitting next to me on the curb, which I think, you know, sometimes when we're coming from suburbia, that is a complete, hmm. uh, we don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen, we've seen uh, the kind of folks helping each other out, protecting each other, looking out for each other. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, there's, there's obviously frictions and, and there can be violence in the, in, you know, on the streets of any city. Uh, but once you get within a community of, of homeless folks, not even necessarily just within a camp, but, um, you know, we've had uh, some of our folks there that are homeless, you know, trying to calm down situations that have gotten escalated off to the side, um, you know, for everybody's benefit. Um, and so there's, there's a, there's an ownership in the community uh, that uh, is pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about this too, but uh, having some of the homeless folks and being engaged in prayer with them is very, very meaningful. And you see a lot of their hearts emerge in that. And I've been humbled different times where 
uh, some of my friends who are homeless come up to me and say, I've been praying for you. Yeah. And I remember, I remember one, one Monday night, it may have been your Monday night, Tom, uh, Joe was gone. Uh, he was out of town on a work trip and, uh, and I was setting up. So I had, had the trailer and was setting up, but my knee was acting up. I, I have bad cartilage and every once in a while the, a knee will get locked up. And I was walking around like Quasimodo. I was <laughs> basically dragging my leg behind me as I was setting up the sound system. Yeah. And, and finally, some of my homeless friends gathered around me and said, can we pray for you? Because we see her struggling. Yeah. And you know what? I, you know, I, I don't want to be too sensational, but my knee got better. You know? <laughs> and I was okay. So, so now whenever I have a problem, I want my, my homeless friends to pray for me because they, they've got the faith. And, uh, and so it, it is enriching. And, and it does change your perspective on who these people are. Yeah. Joe, you mentioned a, a prayer circle. And I remember the very first time I got pulled into that prayer circle. And we were kneeling down like in the street, I think, because we were, you know, it was, it was like the middle of the summer. And I remember that prayer really, it left a huge impact on me because it was, Lord, I'm drunk. Help me go to rehab. And I remember, I think that was maybe Jason's first night. And he was like, bro, <laughs> like you would never hear somebody pray that on a prayer at our church. Like that would never <laughs> happen. But I think that hooked him. And for me too, I was like, man, yeah, this, I got to get more of this real life. And obviously you, you grieve the fact that, you know, this is a guy that we know that he struggles with alcohol, struggles with substances. And, you know, we don't want to make light of that, but the fact that he knows it, and he knows that he needs Jesus. And as much as like, he's not always successful in battling that struggle, he continually throws himself on the grace of God. And I think for some of us who maybe don't have such obvious sins, we're not throwing ourselves on the grace of God. We're saying like, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm better than that guy. So, you know, I'm, I'm all right. And so I, I learned a lot from that, just the humility of being real and saying like, I'm not, I'm a mess and I need Jesus. And I'm like, man, that'll preach <laughs> like that, that will preach. Um, Amen to that. Yeah. I, I, I know the person you're talking about and that person is just convinced of God's unconditional love yeah. for them yeah. and, uh, and that you're saved by grace alone yeah. and not by works. And, and yeah, again, another powerful lesson yeah. from our friends. So, so as we're getting kind of ready to, wind down this conversation i appreciate guys the time um as you look at kind of where you've been with the worship wagon and maybe where you're headed what dreams do you have or maybe for the future of this ministry what do you hope to see in the next phase of the ministry of the worship wagon or what are, what are your hopes of looking forward as you look going to 2021 and and beyond uh, I'll jump in there. I think Bruce and I both have this vision of this gigantic building with stained glass and thousands of parishioners. That's where we're going. That's what we're looking for. That's when I quit. That's when I quit. That's when I'm out. Yeah. No, uh, it, you know, seriously, uh, the idea of these small communities uh, being close to the folks that need to find Jesus and be in, you know, be in relationship with Jesus week after week around Kansas City and maybe in other cities, you know, where we can do what we can do with the resources that God provides and he has provided now for two different uh, locations each week. And, you know, the people that come through, if they, you know, travel to another city and say, hey, I remember that thing in Kansas City, maybe I want to do this in Omaha or Colorado, somewhere in Denver, I don't know. You know, I, I the vision for me is that we provide a way for homeless individuals to experience a church service, biblical teaching, worship opportunity week after week in, a, in an environment that invites them to come. Uh, and I think that's going to be a, you know, a series of small uh, church communities uh, with the right location at the right place at the right time with the right resources. And so, we're not going to see all those. We're not going to be in charge of all those. This is not a big network that's being, you know, run from the top, but it's a, it's a grassroots effort that God is going out this way. And, you know, I just, I would like, I would love nothing more than to hear from somebody who's moving that, you know, to a different city and say, Hey, I want to do that here. 
yeah. or somebody in Kansas, you know, us finding more churches in Kansas City saying, hey, we want to get involved and Bruce and I and those churches finding a third location or fourth location yeah. and letting the people run their, their, little, their little communities of church. Uh, so this is not going to be a giant thing under one umbrella. It's going to spread out, you know, like a field of grass is, is my vision, I think, Bruce, as well. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, and a slightly uh, different track. One thing I'd like to see in the next couple of years uh, uh, is more development of, of touching our friends' lives outside of Monday night. Um, on Thursdays, I, I, I tend to go out and just go do pastoral visitation. And that might be at the park on Third Street and River Market. It might be down in the woods, a couple of the camps. Um, there's a number of places where I, I see our friends on a regular basis. And so I try to do visitation with a couple of my staff members on a regular basis. But I'd love to see that expand. Maybe some of our suburbanites who are regulars and really have developed legitimate friendships to help uh, maybe start a little Bible study outside of Monday night or do some visitation as well. So I'd love to see that develop and mature. Uh, some sometime in the next year and and beyond. You know, it's, I think it's important to say that, that Bruce and I didn't, uh, you know, invent this thing from scratch. Uh, other cities and other people have led before us, and uh, we've learned from those lessons. And you know, uh, we, we both went down to see uh, was it Jimmy Durrell uh, yep. in uh, Church Under the Bridge, and I think Waco. Okay. Um, you know, they, they've got better weather than us. They've got a little bit easier. Um, but, you know, some lessons learned there, uh, you know, kind of fed into what we wanted to do. And I, I, if you go on the internet and search for church under the bridge uh, or similar terms, you'll find little instances in other cities where people have tried to go out and make this happen. And so I think it's an idea that has a lot of merit that Bruce and I didn't make up on our own, that we're part of a, you know, a bigger initiative that God's got at work uh, to reach people in all forms and all places. Uh, so, you know, I, I just hope that, that our positive experience can be uh, mo uh, motivation for others to, to try it in their locations as well. Well, if there's someone who's uh, watching or listening that want to learn more about the Worship Wagon, where can they find you online? Uh, we've got a website, worshipwagon.org, uh, just the two words together, .org, uh, a little bit of our history, you can see kind of how we've structured uh, our church service. You know, I'm really grateful to Bruce uh, and all that he brings to the equation. And he's, he's responsible for giving us a curriculum, a biblical curriculum every year um, and kind of guiding the, the, the partner churches to uh, on how they should bring a message so that we've got some consistency week to week. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we've, that we've done and learned that we put on that website. It's you know free for anybody to go and take and copy and, do with it what you want. So I think a lot of our lessons and a lot of our uh, guiding principles are there at worshipwagon.org. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for the time. Looking forward to being down there with you actually in a couple hours. So um, it's like a good night to be on the, to be outside and worshiping with, with God's people. So uh, for all of you who are have watched or listen, uh, we appreciate you want to subscribe to this channel to get updates about when we drop a new episode. We've got one more next week, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break. Um, but continue to join us week after week as we continue to discover what God is doing in his greater community. We'll see you next time.